Hi, I'm Tom Pfeiffer, and this is called Signal Moments. One of my earliest memories is the sound of the train sliding through the suburban silence of the bedroom of my childhood. We lived four blocks from the station, and as I lay awake at night, I could hear the long muffle of the engineer's horn and the comforting rumble of the train rolling along the tracks. This was the train that took my father to work in the morning and brought him back again at night, sometimes very late. And this was the train my mother and I took into Chicago for a day in the big city. As we walked to the station, we passed the house where the widow's boyfriend lived, the corner lot owned by the vending machine king, the modest brick home of the town manager who'd lost his marbles before anyone knew what Alzheimer's was, and the blue and white Dutch colonial with the graceful Port Cochere, where when my brothers were my age, legend had it, a boy owned a pet duck named Dennis. <laughs> the platform was uh, sunken at the foot of three long flights of concrete stairs, and when it was cold outside, we'd wait inside the station until the little green two Chicago light came on. And when we boarded the train, which was this glorious double-decker, we'd step up into the broad vestibule, and the conductor in his crisp green uniform would lean down and switch the door shut with his key. Sometimes we had to walk through the smoker car to <laughs> find a seat <laughs> holding our breath. It was awful. My mother did smoke at the time, but she never subjected me to those noxious fumes. The seats in this train were made of a rich, rust-colored leather, and uh, they moved back and forth so that you could turn a two uh, into a four. But I preferred to sit on the upper deck where I could reach out and touch the rack where the men kept their hats. Men actually still wore hats when I was a kid. And I loved putting my tickets in the little clip so that the collector could punch them from below. As we entered the city, we marked the stops. Rogers Park, Ravenswood, Clybourne. And as we rolled past the long corrugated roof of the Morton Salt Factory and inhaled this splendid aroma of Blommer's chocolate, then the train went into Northwestern Station. From there, my mother and I walked to Marshall Fields. Don't you dare call it Macy's in front of her now. <laughs> and after some shopping, she'd take me up to the Walnut Room where we'd have lunch, which I always capped off with an Elmer's Gold Brick Sunday. And for those of you who don't know what Gold Brick is, it's this magical chocolate sauce that you pour hot over vanilla ice cream and it hardens instantly into a crunchy chocolate shell. And you could buy it at Fields, but it never really worked out at home in the same way that it tasted in the restaurant. From there, it was off to the dentist to see how many cavities I had. <laughs> and our day in Chicago was never complete unless we visited at least one museum. It was either the Art Institute, where I sat transfixed, staring at Raphael's portrait of Christ crucified on the cross, or the Museum of Contemporary Art, where my mother whose eyes were failing even then, would point out Stella, Motherwell, Frankenthaler, Diebenkorn. <coughs> Invariably on the way back, we'd buy a bag of banana chips at the station and pass the ride home with a game of geography. How else would I know there's a place called Ashtabula? <laughs> when I was nine, the train stopped bringing my father home at night. He died suddenly of a heart attack. And his friend, Harry, took me into his basement, and together we built an enormous train table. And then I brought it home, and I constructed an elaborate train set. Not quite as elaborate <laughs> as the one in there, but pretty elaborate. I had engines, and coal cars, and cattle cars, and cabooses. I had tracks, and switches, and trestles, and bridges, and little men to stand by my signals and switches. And I had trees, and shrubs, and rocks, and lichens to put on my rocks. And I loved withdrawing into the imaginary, perfect world of my train. Because upstairs, outside, my world was not perfect was not perfect at all. And I had entered what I call my months of magical thinking. You see, I thought that if I did certain things, if I picked up a stick or stepped on a crack or went back two blocks and turned a leaf over or just took the long way home from school, that I could somehow bring my father back. I actually believed this. At least, I really wanted to believe it. 
And so after a while, this started driving me crazy, and I was getting home later and later from school, and my mother accused me of the worst crime imaginable, which was dawdling. <laughs> so I came up with a way to, to put an end to it. I said, I'm going to walk up to the front door of my house, and I'm going to open it, and my father's either going to be there or he's not. So on my 10th birthday, I screwed up all my courage, and I walked to the front of the house, and I reached my hand out for that handle, and I turned it, and I pulled open the door. And when you lose a parent at an early age, some doors close for you, but other doors open. And one of the doors that opened for me was much closer relationships with my older brothers, particularly my middle brother, Jim. And in junior high school, I really looked forward to Friday nights when I would get to take the train by myself six stops and stay overnight with him in, in his apartment. He'd pick me up in his old Volvo and we'd head for the fish keg, buy copious amounts of fried seafood, stop at Foremost Liquors for a six pack of beer, and follow that up with dinner and some R-rated television. <laughs> and then I'd get to sleep with him in his bed. And what we did before we went to sleep is we pulled the covers over our head and we played a game called Jungle, where we traveled through deepest, darkest Africa together. And the highlight of the game was when we had to cross a lake. So we had to figure out whether it was safe to swim across this lake or not. So how did we do that? Well, we threw in a cow. We borrowed one from one of the local Maasai tribesmen. And if the cow sank, fast and furious in a flurry of bubbles, we knew there were piranhas in the lake and it was not safe to swim across. But if the cow sank slowly, if it just kind of burbled down its last then it was safe. <laughs> there were no piranhas in the water. So I soon crossed into high school where there were 1,100 kids in my graduating class and I became a small fish in a, in a very uh, large pond. But I got lucky my freshman year. Well, not, not that lucky, but I did get lucky. <laughs> and, uh, I, I reeled in a, a wonderful girlfriend who was in my French class named, named Sally. And neither one of us could drive at the time because we were 14, 15 years old. So on our first date, we took the train, like everyone else in my class, to Dave's Italian Kitchen, which was six stops away and right at the foot of the station. I remember nothing of the meal except that it was Italian. I remember the kiss afterwards. And I remember wearing this hat the entire time. My hair was much longer than it is now. And I had this hat shoved down on my head because this is the hat that my father was wearing on the day he died. And it was very special to me. And I also remember a few months later getting a phone call from Sally one night and hearing her say to me, I'm sorry, but I can't see you anymore. And I felt the jolt of those brakes, and I heard the hiss of the compressors deflating. <laughs> and that sickening lurch of the love train coming to a full and devastating stop. Well, I got over her and I grew up. I went to college out east, found a girl, lost a girl, moved east, got married, had kids, got divorced, got married again, got divorced again. <laughs> a lot of stops on this train. <laughs> and, uh, and I became a commuter. And uh, if you add up the miles on my trip from Westport to New York and back again every day over the course of a year, it's 25,000. Could, I could actually circumnavigate the globe with, with that many miles. And what I do on the train in the morning is I write. I, I, I write blog entries every morning. And I, I sit backwards. And there is something about being moved backwards through space and forwards through time that, that gives me a kind of a balance. And there's something about the compression of the hour that I have from one station to the other that's very conducive to finishing my work and hitting publish before the train descends into the tunnel at 125th Street. And when the train brings me home at night and I tuck my children in to the suburban silence of their bedroom, sometimes, if I listen very closely, I can hear the faint, fleeting, deeply comforting 
sound of the train. Thank you.